Hello, friends. Welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. I'm John Lomakang. I want to thank you for taking the time to tune in every week as we walk through the Word of God together. This has been an exciting quarter. The overall theme is the promise, God's everlasting covenant. And lesson number eight is covenant law. All you need to follow us is a Bible and a willing heart and also a copy of the Sabbath School lesson if you so desire. To get a copy to download, go to absg.adventist.org to download a digital copy or go to your local Seventh-day Adventist church and join in on an excursion together in a group if it's possible. But if not, we thank you for joining us here because we pray that God's presence will be your guide, God's Holy Spirit will be your teacher, and God's Word will be the platform on which you stand. So join us now for Covenant Law. Hello friends, welcome back to our Sabbath School lesson. We are talking about the election of grace, something every one of us is tremendously in need of. And we're going to talk about what is grace, what application does it have in context to talking about the covenants, the everlasting covenant. To my left, though, are my Sabbath School panelists, those who've been joining me. Shelly, always good to have you. I guess you saw my tie and decided to wear a purple jacket. I huh? did. No, <laughs> that was an accident, wasn't it? Yes, good to have you here today. Good to be here. Yes, Pastor Denzi. It's a blessing for me to be here as well, and I'm looking forward to this lesson study. Yes, and Ryan, what could you say about our lesson study today? And it's going to be on fire as always. I'm excited about it. <laughs> okay, and my good friend Jill, Thank are you, you Pastor ready? Thank you, Pastor John. I'm ready. Talking about if. That's my lesson is if. Wow, one one word. One word, two letters. <laughs> okay, well, if you would pray for us, then we can get going. <laughs> I will. Holy Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, grateful for the gift of your word and your covenant of salvation, which you extended from the very beginning, Adam and Eve, all the way down through the history of time. We ask right now for the anointing of your Holy Spirit, that you would open up our minds and hearts to receive what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you so much. And by the way, if you don't have a Bible, just go ahead and open it up and get something to write because we like to communicate things that may be of interest to you. The election of grace. We've been talking all week long and actually all quarter long up to now this lesson number eight about the covenants, the everlasting covenants, the salvific covenants that the Lord established, the uh, Davidic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, uh, different covenants, the Noahic covenant. We find that all through the Bible, there's really only been one covenant because there's only one God, but he has confirmed and reaffirmed that covenant from generation to generation up until the point where we have the phrase, uh, the new covenant in the book of Hebrews chapter 10. And we find today that in all of this law keeping, we have to understand that without the law, there will be no need for grace. I want to make that very clear. So when we talk about the covenant and the Ten Commandments is, in fact, the transcript of God's covenant, but even more than that, the transcript of his character, we have to understand where there is no law, there is no need for grace. Now, let me not run past that because somebody watching might say, but doesn't the Bible say we're saved by grace through faith? And that not of ourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. That's completely true. And we embrace and believe that because it is in fact God's word. But would you need grace if there was no law? Let me give one quick illustration. Uh, you know, they say confession is good for the soul, hard on the reputation. A couple of years ago, well, actually in 2006, I was driving to New York and I was going to clean out my dad's apartment. He had passed away. He lived downtown in New York City. And I was driving my SUV. My wife was with me. This was before they had those little portable GPSs that you put on the dashboard. As a matter of fact, I had my big old honking laptop, <laughs> Ryan, right there on my center console. And I was trying to look at my speed and what direction to go. It was an archaic 
They didn't have it on cell phones. It was an old little small dashboard, uh, GPSs. But I'm looking at my laptop, this big 12-inch screen, driving, looking, driving, and I kept going faster and faster and faster through, in the, through the state of Indiana. I was going 87 miles an hour when I saw a highway patrolman. And he was blocked by this large trailer truck. As, so as, as I came around the curve, there he was, and his lights came on immediately. Well, I decided to slow down because I knew he wasn't coming out to give me a sandwich or anything. He was coming out to have a conversation. And I thought, well, I'm going to get an invitation today to the courthouse in Indiana. Not looking forward to it, but he pulled over and he says, can I ask you a question? Why are you going so fast? I said, honestly, officer, I really wasn't looking at my speedometer. I was looking down at my laptop and he looked over and he saw my laptop. I said, I was trying to figure out what exit to get off next because I was getting close to the exit. He said, do you realize how fast you were going? I said, in the 80s, he said, I clocked you at 87 miles an hour. License registration, it became to the point, I gave him my license registration. He said, get your insurance card, I'll be right back. Well, he came back and he tipped his hat back and he said, and what's the emergency? I said, well, really there's no emergency, but I'm going to New York, my dad passed away, I'm clearing out his apartment. And he looked at me and he said, you know what? You slow it down, we'll call it a day. Is that all right? I said, thank you, officer. I was kind and cordial and he walked away gave me back my license and registration. Now, did I say, Arr! no, I pulled off and I stayed about five miles an hour under the speed limit for a long time because I knew that I had violated the law and I just received grace. So I want you to understand today when we talk about the election of grace, Grace has never been separated from the law of God. As a matter of fact, look at some very powerful passages on the context of grace and law in the framework of salvation. I want you to get that because the election of grace is something that the Lord extends to every one of us. And the memory text for the week is Deuteronomy 7 verse 9. Let's start with that. Deuteronomy 7 verse 9, the memory text of the week. Notice what the Lord says very clearly. And by the way, Deuteronomy, the book, is in fact a second canonical representation of the generation that grew up now in the wilderness journey. Exodus was, they were probably young kids and not understanding very well, or they probably weren't even born yet, but now this book is to the new generation. Deuteronomy 7 verse 9, therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and what? Keep his commandments. That didn't even change because Jesus, John 14 verse 15 says, if you love me, keep my commandments. That didn't change. This covenant to a thousand generations, and I will tell you there was not a thousand generations between this statement and the statement of Jesus. So the covenant conditions haven't changed. The Lord says, I will do whatever you want me to do. Not whatever, but I will fulfill my promises if you fulfill your obligation. If you keep my commandments, I will be the God who continues to extend to you the mercy and the justice that you deserve. But now let's go to 2 Peter 3, verse 18. I want you to see something because we are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. But do we make void the law through faith? As one of our past lessons, I think Pastor Ryan Day says, no, God forbid we establish it. But I want you to see how we are growing because we talk about salvation here and the everlasting covenant of grace as well as the everlasting covenant of law. All is in the framework of our growth as Christians. Look at this. Second Peter 3 and verse 18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be the glory both now and forever. I want to make a very important point here. We don't grow into grace. We grow in grace. A fish doesn't swim into the sea. It swims in the sea. A plant doesn't grow into the pot. It grows in the pot. We are growing in grace, meaning we are in it already. We don't get grace more and more every day. We are growing in that grace. So why do we need to grow in that grace? Because we still have this frail thing called the human flesh. We are not glorified yet. 
we are still being sanctified. And so when it says, for by grace are you saved, a better way of saying that is, for, for by grace you are being saved. Because Isaiah 25 verse 9 says, he will save us. Paul in the Corinthians, to the Corinthians says, we are being saved. So we need grace. I know you know you need grace. I know that every morning I wake up before, my, before I put my feet in my shoes, I got to pray, Lord, give me grace today that I can reflect your character. So I want to make sure that we can clearly see that the author is making it clear that we all need grace. But let's continue. Let's go to another one. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 9. Let's look at the election of grace and see it in a, an abounding, beautiful way. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 9. The Lord is talking about this grace. And why would we need grace? Because as we drive, there's this constant speed limit that says to us, ah, 25 now, 30, 40, 50. It's continually changing. And if we ignore the fact that law always exists, we might be asking for grace. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. Shelly, do you have that? Yes, I do. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, one of my favorites. He said to me, my grace, this is Christ speaking to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. The apostle Paul said, hey, if there's anybody that you're looking for that has infirmities, I have it. We all have infirmities. What is that? weakness. Now, why do we need grace? And a, a second most beautiful aspect, the Lord is saying to us, you're weak, but I'm perfect. My strength is perfect. My, his strength is perfect. Now watch this. He covers us in his salvation. He imparts to us a strength that we don't even own or possess. And then he says, as weak as you are, I'm still strong. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. Now, why is Paul boasting? Because when I know I have access to a power that never fails, when I know I have access to a righteousness that God always sees as perfect, and I'm covered by that, it's like a scaffolding. It's like covering a house that's about to be fumigated. We don't see the house. We see the covering. When the Lord covers us with his righteousness, we must say, thank God for his perfect salvation that is made strong in my infirmity, in my human weakness. But what does the law have to do with anything? Let's go to Romans 5 and verse 20. Let's go to Romans 5 and verse 20. And uh, it's going to be a while before I forget that illustration that Pastor Ryan Day did with the cotton in his head. But um, this is why he did it. This is why he did it. Romans 5 and verse 20. The Bible says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Now watch this. I got pulled over and I just found out I was 22 miles over the speed limit. According to the law, 20 miles over the speed limit is good enough for them to take my license. But the police officer said, you slow it down, we will call it a day. You know, friends, when you fall, our Savior, Jesus Christ, says, do you know I have every right to condemn you to death because the wages of sin is death. But what I'm going to do for you today, because your infirmities are so clear to me, in your weakness, my strength is going to be made perfect. That's the grace of God. The election of grace is not saying that you are a great sinner alone, but the election of grace is saying I'm a greater Savior then you are a sinner. You see, in the Ark of the Covenant, the Ten Commandments of God are there. But above the Ark of the Covenant is the mercy seat. Far greater than my sin is God's mercy. That is the election of grace. Amen. Thank you. That perfectly sets up my day. Monday ties that bind. I love what Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy. 1, 9, and 10, we won't turn there. But he said that grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. This is, he, he's alluding to Revelation 13, 8, the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world, where Hebrews 13, 20 says, Christ's blood 
is the blood of the everlasting covenant. So all of God's, as you said, all of his covenants are a progressive unfolding of this everlasting covenant of redemption. Last week we looked at Moses and when he went up to the, the mountain and God gave to Moses, he'd already spoken the Ten Commandments to the people, but when Moses went back up to the mountain, after they'd already uh, heard that, he, he received from the Lord what you will say are civil laws. It was, to, it was the constitution for the new nation of Israel. That's what it was. And the Ten Commandments were the Bill of Rights. It's how God, that they were going to treat God, how they were going to treat one another. And so then it also had the ceremonial laws, the sacrificial laws, the uh, special Sabbaths, you know, the annual Sabbaths. I'm not speaking of the Seventh-day Sabbath, but the festivals, the annual Sabbaths, the drink offerings, meal offerings, etc. This is found in Moses Moses, Exodus 20, 22 through 23, 22. So we read last week in Exodus 24, 7, that Moses receives this instruction. And now Moses writes this, maybe on papyrus or a skin. He writes this in what is called the Book of the Covenant. And then we looked 39 years later when he reiterates the Book of the Covenant it is now called the book of the law. It's according to Deuteronomy 31, 26. He rewrites and reiterates all of this in his final sermon. And God tells him to put the book of the law on the side of the ark. It was to stand there as a witness against them because it, can, it was the blessings and the curses but you've got the Ten Commandments in the ark, permanence, the book of the covenant, which is now the book of the law on the side of the ark. This is a temporary position because it is the constitution for the new nation of Israel. Now, God says in Deuteronomy 29, 13, his purpose for the covenant was that he might establish the people as a people for himself and that he may be God to them. However much we have stressed that salvation is by grace, grace is not a license to disobey. Deuteronomy 4.13 says, He declared to you his covenant which he commanded you to perform, the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone. We saw last week that God wrote these Ten Commandments both times. At the first time when Moses broke them after the people broke the covenant, but the second time. And the commandments were written, the stone tablets on the front and on the back. But they are the foundation of God's government of love. So the Ten Commandments, as I said, are like the Bill of Rights in the constitution of the Old Covenant. It is how it defines Love to the creator and love to your neighbor. In the Ten Commandment is also the heart of the new covenant. Let me, let me share this with you. Hebrews 8.10. Speaking of the new covenant, God's law of love, his instructions of love found in the Ten Commandments. Hebrews 8.10. He's speaking of the new covenant. He says, this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. And then he's always saying, I will be their God and they will be my people. The old covenant, Moses was the mediator. The new covenant, Jesus is the mediator. There's only one mediator between us and God, and that's Jesus. The old covenant was the constitution. It was laws uh, built on God's Ten Commandment principles to govern the new nation of Israel. Then 
in the new covenant, I mean, the old covenant, they get the constitution from Mount Sinai. The new covenant, God's constitution is changed. Those civil laws, Christ came to magnify. Where do we find the parallel to the book of the covenant? We find it on the Mount of Beatitudes. Christ came and he is now giving a new constitution for a new Israel. You know, Matthew, when he introduces the a book, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. He does it against the backdrop of Moses. He's making a parallel. And so Christ then gives us new, a new constitution. Both covenants include the Ten Commandments. And we have to remember the covenant is an arrangement. God's covenants with a will, a testament. That's why we call it the Old Testament, the New Testament. And the concept of an arrangement, a relationship, there's rules. Aren't there boundaries in your relationship? When you get married, you are taking one wife to you. There, see, boundaries define us. They say what's acceptable and what's unacceptable. And guess what? Boundaries, we train people how to treat us. So God is a boundary-making God. He said, these are the principles of love. This is how you should love me with all your heart, mind, soul, and, and strength. And then here's the principles of love to your fellow human being. This is the vertical grace, if you will. And we, every partnership has boundaries, rules, every marriage, I mean, I can't imagine if J.D. married me and then just said the next week, well, I'm going to go out with so-and-so. She, she appeals to me. That wouldn't go over very well at all. So he makes these promises. God makes all of the promises. But then he asks us, he invites us into relationship with him. I'll be your God. You'll be, you'll be my child. You'll be my daughter. You'll be my, my son. Come into relationship with me. And here's these boundaries. Now, in the Old Covenant, it contained various requirements that were special uh, or that were required for the special relationship. But it's the same for the New Covenant. And here's something that I, I'm just going to forget about my notes because I don't have time. I remember when God started showing me because, you know, we talk about the ceremonial law being uh, nailed to the cross. Well, so was the old civil law. We no longer stone uh, adulterers. Praise God. There'd be a lot of dead people around uh, in this day and age. But, you know, people say, oh, that old covenant looks impossible to keep. Man, I'll tell you, how many times do you hear the Sermon on the Mount, and I've got this in a later one, but Jesus came to magnify the law. He said, you've heard it said that if you commit adultery, you know, don't commit adultery. I'm telling you, if you lust in your heart, you're committing adultery. You've heard it said that if you murder, it's wrong. I'm telling you, if you hate your brother, it's wrong. So we've got to realize that the reason it, it, God let it look impossible, because the Sermon on the Mount looks impossible, isn't it? I mean, when you read it. But that's because God wants us to understand we could never do it on our own. It's always been His grace is sufficient. His strength is made perfect. And the new ceremonial laws, Christ fulfilled all of those old laws. It is the power of the cross. It is Christ ministry in the heavenly places. Amen. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you so much. Well, we're going to take a short break and come right back for Tuesday's lesson, so don't go away. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3 School Panel.com. 
A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to our 3ABN Sabbath School panel. I'm going to turn the time over to Pastor John Dinsey. It's yours. Thank you very much. Now we are in Tuesday's portion. And the lesson for Tuesday is entitled Law Within the Covenant. Law Within the Covenant. So when you think of the word law, most people are right away thinking of, well, the police, traffic, uh, maybe jail. But the laws of the Lord were meant for the good of the people. And when you see in the Bible the word law in the Old Testament, normally it is the word Torah, which means instruction and also means uh, teaching. So normally when you talk to the, to the Jews about it, when they say the Torah, they're talking about the first five books of the Bible, books of Moses. A question is brought here in the lesson that I'd like to bring out. Why do you suppose God provided so much instruction for Israel? And we are going to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 through 13. And the Bible says uh, there, and now Israel, what does the Lord your God require you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. See, the laws and instructions that the Lord gave to the people of Israel, it included as well as the issues of social life, religious life, and even dietary laws and health laws are, are there. It also, there were laws to protect the land. And I'm going to share some scripture uh, very soon here that uh, where the Lord told the people that even the land had to rest. And if we were to practice this today, our food would be more nutritious than it is now. You see, through the Jewish nation, I'm going to bring this out from Colossians, uh, not, not from Colossians, but the book Christ Object Lessons, page 286. Notice, this is beautiful. Through the Jewish nation, it was God's purpose to impart rich blessings to all peoples. Through Israel, the way was to be prepared for the diffusion of His light to the whole world. The nations of the world, through following corrupt practices, had lost the knowledge of God. Yet in His mercy, God did not blot them out of existence. He purposed to give them opportunity for becoming acquainted with Him through His church. He designed that the principles revealed through His people should be the means of restoring the moral image of God in man. You see, the, for example, the laws that the Lord gave to the people of Israel concerning a, a contagious disease, that they have to be washed, that they have to be separated from the people, the things that they were sitting on had to be cleaned, uh, washed, set, we were used today the word sanitized, you know. Uh, and these people, when they had a contagious disease, were told to separate from the family, separate from their home. Otherwise, mm -hmm. everyone in the home would be sick. And before you know it, the whole camp of Israel would have a contagious disease. One of those diseases that was incurable, they said, was leprosy. And so as you read about leprosy, you will see that it was highly contagious. And God placed before the people instruction to protect them from this deadly disease. Let's go to a... Leviticus chapter 25, verse 2, 3, and 4. And this is beautiful, what God told the people to do. Uh, notice, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six years thou shalt sow thy field, six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year, shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. So we see here that God wanted even the land to rest. Why? The continued planting and, 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 and growing and sowing, all these things eventually would deplete the soil of its nutrients. So God said, let's give the land a rest, one year of rest, and then the soil could recover from 
the use. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 5 through 8, because there is a lesson for us here that is of vital importance. Surely, this is Moses speaking, Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore, be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us for whatever reason we may call upon Him? And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you this day? The laws that God gave to the people of Israel were for their blessing and their protection. You have uh, heard of also the law of ordinances, and we're going to talk briefly about that because, uh, and we're going to cover this as we continue in this study of the, this quarterly. Uh, notice what is written again in the book Christ Object Lessons concerning the commandments and the statutes. Page 289, if they would keep his commandments, God promised to give them the finest of wheat and bring them honey out of the rock. With long life would he satisfy them and show them his salvation. Through disobedience to God, Adam and Eve had lost Eden. And because of sin, the whole earth was cursed. But if God's people followed his instruction, their land would be restored to fertility and beauty. God himself gave them directions in regard to the culture of the soil, and they were to co cooperate with him in its restoration. Thus, the whole land under God's control would become an object lesson of spiritual growth, spiritual truth. As in obedience to his natural laws, the earth should produce its treasures. So in obedience to his moral law, the hearts of the people were to reflect the attributes of his character. Even the heathen would recognize the superiority of those who served and worshiped the living God. So praise the Lord. The laws were supposed to protect the people and bless the people. And because of time, I have to move over quickly to uh, talking about a separation between the laws of ordinances, the laws of sacrifices. These laws pointed to Jesus, our sacrifice. They were of temporary benefit because when people would sacrifice uh, for their sins, they were to consider and understand that the Son of God was coming to die for them, for their sins. So these had temporary benefit because they were a shadow of good things to come. Now, I'm going to read to you uh, from Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. Notice what the Bible says there. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now, some people think this is referring to the Ten Commandments. No, it is not referring to the Ten Commandments because the Ten Commandments are not a shadow of good things to come, but they are God, a transcript of God's character. Now, a, one of the pioneers, one of the uh, ancient authors of the Seventh-day Adventist Church wrote something very interesting concerning this particular text. And it's very interesting, and I would like for you to hear it. It's from uh, the History of the Sabbath, page 138. He says, The whole is declared a shadow of good things to come, and the body which casts this shadow is of Christ. That law which was proclaimed by the voice of God and was written by His own finger upon the tables of stone and deposited beneath the mercy seat was altogether unlike the system of carnal ordinances that was written by Moses in a book. It was completely different. And placed in the side of the ark. Now notice what he says. It would be absurd to speak of the tables of stone as nailed to the cross. You can't do it. They're made of stone. And he says, or to speak of blotting out what was engraved in stone. Quite different from writing on, on, on papyrus. Or, how do you say it? Papyrus. Quite different that you can blot it out, you can burn it, and you can blot it out. So God's law was written on stone, His Ten Commandments. And so I would like to point out to you 
uh, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29. Notice the, this marvelous verse. All that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep all my commandments that it might be well with them and with their children forever. God's Ten Commandments continue today to be a guide to guide us to Jesus, but also to help us understand that God's law is eternal. It cannot be changed. They are a transcript of God's character. Mm. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much, Pastor Denzi. Amen. That sets me up great for Wednesday's lesson entitled, The Stability of God's Law. And, uh, you know, this is something that I think a lot of people struggle with in the sense of especially the uh, kind of the evangelical Christian society that we live in today where there's so much, um, there's so much doubt you know, against the law of God in the sense of how and what role at all it plays within our Christian walk with the Lord. And so the lesson actually starts off with a question that I'm going to ask here, and then we're going to answer that question and uh, build on it throughout this lesson. So it asks, what truth about God does the presence of God's law in the covenant relationship teach us about His essential nature. And I love the answer it gives because it's one of my favorite texts, Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. I am the Lord. He says, for I am the Lord. I do not change. King James says, I change not, right? God does not change in the sense that, uh, you know, we can bank on the fact that God does not change in nature or in character. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. His standards are always the same, and the same divine, loving God you have here is the same wonderful, graceful God over here, right? So you say the same God, and it's why you hear a lot of Christians say, you know, the God of the Old Testament and, you know, the, the, the Savior in the New Testament is two different people that I see. No, no, no. If, you, if you're reading the story of Scripture properly and you're allowing the Word of God to speak to you, then you know it's the same gracious, loving God all throughout. It's the people that change, not the Lord. And of course, the people's changing, of course, their lack of obedience caused the Lord to, uh, you know, go about changing some of his methods and some of his approach, but never his character, never his law. And that's the, what this lesson is talking about, the stability of God's law that we see throughout Scripture. Another great text uh, that it presents here in the, in the lesson that I really enjoyed was James chapter 1, verse 17. Again, James 1, 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from... Is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Again, it's it's uh, uh, implying and, and very much uh, solidifying the fact that God does not change. It's the same God throughout, and the same thing can be said about His eternal law. God's law, as a part of the everlasting covenant, is a true gift indeed. Uh, and so we have this to say that the, this is the same eternal, omniscient, omnipotent, omnibenevolent God revealing himself and his character to us constantly. He is sharing with us the, uh, the law, which, uh, of course, is his eternal kingdom is governed by. So right now, you know, if, if we could particularly take a trip into heaven right now, uh, you would see that God's kingdom, heaven, is governed by the law of God. And it's interesting because when you jump into, we, we've mentioned here the, the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 through 23 actually reveals a little something here to us, kind of gives us an idea into the significance, the importance, and the stability of God's law within one's life. Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 through 23. We've read this many times in lessons past. This is something that people often, uh, they don't forget this passage, at least I don't. This was a very big passage in my growing and my, uh, you know, uh, my maturity in the Lord. Matthew 7, 21 through 23, this is a part of the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does what? The will of my Father in heaven. And then he goes on to say, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonderful works or wonders in your name? And then he says this in verse 23, And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, the reason why I read all the way through to the end, I'm going to back up there to the very first verse because it says there, uh, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom, but he who does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. What is the will of God? Well, the context of this particular verse here kind of gives us an idea because he's pronouncing upon those that he's saying, I don't know you. Why? Because those who practice 
lawlessness. So what is the will of God for our life? Psalm 40 verse 8 gives us an indication of that when the psalmist wrote, I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my mouth. So it is the will of God that we be stable and solidified and grounded in the fact that His character is basically transcribed within that law. It is not, again, as we've brought out many times, you know, these rules and regulations, you know, thou shalt and thou shalt not and don't do this and don't do that. But there, are, there are 10 promises that we see there in which God is saying, I'm bestowing my will upon you. If you are keeping my commandments, if you're obedient to my law, then you are following in my will. Uh, Walter R. Beach in his book, Dimensions in Salvation, which was, re which was published by the Review and Herald in, uh, uh, on page 143 of his book. It was, it was published back in 1963. This is what he says, powerful quote here. He says, the assurance that God is reliable and dependable lies in the truth that He is a God of law. His will and His law are one. God says that right is right because it describes the best possible relationships. Therefore, God's law is never arbitrary or subject to whim and fancy. It is the most stable thing in the universe. Why? Because God's kingdom is governed by God's law, right? If you know, want to know who God is, look at His law. It tells you exactly who He is. And so if God's law cannot save a person, which we learned that from previous lessons, if God's law does not save a person from sin, then why did He make it a part of the covenant? Because we've talked about how it's the heart of the covenant. I love Amos 3, verse 3. I love this. It says, Can, can two walk together unless they are agreed? So we learned last week uh, in, in our, and I did my little illustration last week of how obviously God gave the law so that the children of Israel would be able to see their sin, not for it to save them, but they would be able to see their sin and see their need, therefore, of a Savior to be cleansed from their sin. And that is true. But also God gives His law not as a means of salvation, not as a means for us to be uh, saved you know, uh, by that law, but it also uh, here is, is establishing the fact within the lesson that God establishes or puts this beautiful Ten Commandment law within the overall covenant plan, this covenant relationship plan, because He wants us to be in agreement. He wants us to be on the same page, right? And this was Lucifer's problem. This was ultimately what Lucifer's, Lucifer had this problem when he was in heaven. And we see the record of that when we go back to Ezekiel 28. Uh, and also we can read there in Isaiah chapter 14. You know, but in Ezekiel 28, it says that Lucifer was a covering cherub. What was he covering? What was he protecting? What was he uh, you know, further establishing and upholding in the kingdom of God? He was one of those two covering cherubs in the very presence of the Lord that was upholding, establishing, protecting, covering God's holy law. But there came a point in which he said, I don't agree with that anymore. I want my own law. I want to do my own thing. And so he basically rebelled against God. He looked within himself and began to see his own beauty and he began to rebel against the governmental law of God. And it's interesting, uh, as I was doing a little bit of study, I've come up with, come to this name or to this name many times in my studies in the past, but you know, I'm asking the question at this point, does that same mentality seem to be manifested within society and sometimes even within the church today? that I know there's the law of God over here, but I just, I feel like I'm going to do what I want to do. And this was basically the concept of a man by the name of Aleister Crawley. If you've ever done your, your research on a man by the name of Aleister Crawley, he's known as the father of modern Satanism. And he goes over to Egypt for his honeymoon back in the early 1900s, and he comes back saying, I've received this incredible revelation by some spiritual voice of some kind. And he writes what is known as the book of the law. And the whole thesis of that book of the law is... Do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. In other words, there's no balance. There's no stability. Do what you want to do. There's nothing that grounds us to moral standards and you know, the, the difference in understanding the differentiation between what is right, what is wrong, what is evil, what is good, what is bad. So Matthew chapter 12, verse 20, or 24, verse 12 also clearly tells us that in the last days, this would be the same issue prior to the second coming of Jesus. And it says there in Matthew 24, 12, and because of lawlessness, the lawlessness will abound, it says, the love of many will grow 
cold. And we're seeing that indeed in society today. But, you know, God's law is stable. And we can have stability within the law of God to approach it in its right context. Not as a means of salvation, but to see it as that great mirror that shows our need of the Savior that points us to Jesus. I love what Jesus said in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40. It said, Jesus said unto them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. But then in verse 39, he says, The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And we know that, yes, indeed, if you take those first four commandments, as Shelley brought out earlier, and you take those last six commandments, and you, you, you look at those in, in proper uh, context, you'll see the first four points us to our love and our service for God. And, of course, the last six, our love and our service for man. God's law is stable, and in Christ we are stable as well. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, each one of you. What an incredible lesson, covenant law. The role of law in our lives as Christians, not just for the children of Israel, but us today. My lesson is just one word. That's the title, if. So I want to start with an if-then statement. Now, an if-then statement is also known as a conditional statement. We have a hypothesis followed by a conclusion. We would say, if this happens, then that will happen. This is not going to happen unless you have this. This is the condition. You could say, if you work overtime, you'll be paid time and a half. Now, not everybody's paid time and a half, are they? You have a condition. You have to work overtime to be paid time and a half. What about this one? I'll wash the car if the weather is nice. The condition is what? The weather needs to be nice. If the weather's nice, then I wash the car. I'll be a millionaire when I play Monopoly. The condition is when I play Monopoly, I will be a millionaire. There is a condition there. If then statements. Let's look at if then statements for the covenant. Exodus 19, verse 5. We're going to jump through several verses very quickly here. Exodus 19, 5. Now, therefore, if, here's the condition, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all the people, for all the earth is mine. If you obey, then you will be my covenant people. Jump over to Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 26, verses 3 through 9. We're not going to read all of those verses, but it begins with an if, that conditional statement. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and perform them, then, and then it goes an entire list of things that God is going to do. You jump down to verse 9. I will look on you favorably and make you fruitful, multiply you, and confirm my covenant with you. So the condition is if you walk in my statutes and my commandments, mm -hmm. then what? I will give you rain. Your land and trees will be fruitful. You will eat bread. You will dwell in the land safely. You will not be afraid. No evil beasts or evil men will be around you. You will be victorious in battle. You will be fruitful and multiply, and I will confirm my covenant with you. God did the same thing with Abraham. Genesis 26, verses 4 and 5. I will make your descendants. Now, this one's backwards. This one starts with what's going to happen. Then it goes to the condition. I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Now, here's the if. Because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. You would see, if Abraham obeyed God's law, if he kept his statutes, if he kept his covenant, then God promised to multiply his descendants. He promised to give him land. He promised to bless the entire earth through his seed, and of course, specifically the one seed, the Messiah. One more if-then covenant statement, Deuteronomy 28. We call this the law of blessings and curses. Mm -hmm. Deuteronomy 28, we're not going to read all those verses, but it starts in verse 1. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today, 
that the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth and all these blessings will come upon you and overtake you because there's another if you obey the voice of the Lord your God and then all of these blessings it takes you all the way down to verse 14. So if you obey the voice of the Lord your God and obey his commandments what's God going to do? He will set you on high above all the nations of the earth. He will bless you in the city and bless you in the country and bless the fruit of your body and your produce and herds. He will bless your basket and your kneading bowl, bless you when you come in and when you go out. The Lord will defeat your enemies. The Lord will bless your finances. The Lord will establish you as his special people. The Lord will give you rain. The Lord will make you the lender, not the borrower. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. If you read that passage, all of those are in that passage in um, Deuteronomy chapter 28. The condition, the if portion, the obedience portion is still an act of grace. The covenant is not forced. It's freely entered into by the people. The obligations follow not as a means of earning that covenant blessing, but as an outward manifestation of walking in covenant with God. The condition which is obedience is by grace through faith. I want to talk for just a moment on the two garments, I always call them, that we have the privilege and opportunity to put on the imputed righteousness of Christ and the imparted righteousness of Christ. The first one, the imputed, is justification. That is by grace we are saved through faith. Abraham, this is Genesis 15, 6, he believed God and it was accounted, reckoned, mm -hmm. imputed to him for righteousness. Now, he had not engaged in works because circumcision did not even enter until a couple chapters later. That was not even part of that. We see that Abraham believed God. It was by faith, righteousness by faith, justification. When he believed God, instantly he was covered. He was clothed with Christ's perfect garment of righteousness. At that moment of justification, you and I stand before the Father as if we have never sinned. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. I love this. He made him, God made Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I always call that the double imputation, mm -hmm. meaning my sin is imputed to Christ. He had no sin, but he took my sin. Mm -hmm. And his righteousness is imputed or reckoned to my account. Then we see the imparted righteousness of Christ. Now this is sanctification. The first justification is our title for heaven. Sanctification is our fitness for heaven. This imparted righteousness of Christ, if you look at Revelation 19, 8, talking of the church, it says, to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen, excuse me, is the righteous acts of the saints. Now when you first read that, you think, Oh, wow. Okay, I was saved by grace. This was the imputed righteousness of Christ. He covered me, and now all of a sudden, I'm my second garment, the imparted righteousness of Christ, mm -hmm. is my righteous acts. No, it's Christ working in me, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's Colossians 1, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, Christ in you the hope of glory. It's Romans 6. Romans 6 verse 16 talks about how we surrender whoever we choose to obey as a master. That slave, you could say, we are, whether of obedience leading to righteousness or disobedience. So every morning when you wake up, we have a choice. Am I going to make a choice and serve Jesus. And if I do, he comes in and the power of the indwelling spirit does the works as I am connected with him. It's a moment by moment, not just in the morning, day by day, surrender to him that does that work of righteousness and transformation in my heart and in my life. Now I want to touch in my closing moments on one thought. 
the if-then statement. You might say, okay, I'm walking in righteousness. I'm walking in every all the light I know. I'm choosing Jesus. But I haven't experienced all those covenant blessings that were read about in Deuteronomy 28. If the promises are not fulfilled, it is, all, is, it, it is not always a result of failure on the part of the obedient one. Sometimes it's because we live in a world of sin. John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said that he came that we would have life and have it more abundantly. Sometimes it's the world of sin that we live in. Sometimes it's that God can be glorified. I think of John 9 and the man who was born blind and the right. disciples said, who sinned, this man or his parents? Right. Jesus said, neither. It's that God could be glorified. Sometimes it's so that God's grace can be revealed in greater ways. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Sometimes it's so that we can bring greater fruit to the glory of God. John 15, every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bring forth more fruit. Mm. Amen. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jill and Ryan and Pastor Denzi and Shelley. Now I'll give each of you a chance to summarize your day. Well, the title of this message was Ties That Bind for Monday's Lesson. And I'm just sitting here thinking the real tie that binds us God's love is the compelling force behind his grace. We are saved by grace, but he, the, the instructions of love and liberty, the law of liberty are the Ten Commandments. And when people live by those commandments, that is the tie that binds in the old covenant. It's the tie that binds in the new. Amen, amen. You know, if the Ten Commandments were nailed to the cross, then it would contradict Hebrews 10, 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. Amen. There's a little note here uh, on uh, Wednesday's lesson. It says, God's law was and is the pur purpose of the covenant relationship to bring the believer through God's transforming grace into harmony with His will and character. If then statements, we are called to walk in obedience and that obedience is obtained through the power and grace of the Lord Jesus. Wow, we've talked about God's covenant and we are continuing on the everlasting covenant, the promises of God, and we thank you for tuning in. But as we close talking about the election of grace and the election of Israel, we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, God's own special people, that we should show forth the praises of him who called us out of darkness into this marvelous light. Join us next time for Covenant Sign. God bless you until then.